behind me stand the office towers of the City of London, one of the greatest centres for finance capital anywhere in the world. They're certainly symbols of power and prestige and high culture, perhaps also of oppression and intimidation. But they're not like the great royal palaces, they're not like Versailles, they're not gilded, detailed, various and ornate. Rather, they're clean and sparse. So why? Well, the origins, oddly, go right back to the middle of the 19th century and to avant the avant-garde, the avant-garde in literature, in painting, and later in architecture. Avant-garde forms, when they were first produced, were received with extreme incomprehension and even hostility. People really didn't understand it and saw it as a great threat to the hierarchies of culture as they'd understood it before. So can we recover the strangeness of the avant-garde, its oddity, the reason why it was so reviled at the time? Shortly, we'll be looking at a painting by Manet, which is one of the signal avant-garde pieces, to see if we can understand the hostility with which it was received when it was first unveiled. This painting shows us a modern scene, perhaps of a rather tawdry kind. It's of a modern spectacle. And the central figure is not a hero, but a woman of low-class status. If we look at this painting, we can see a server at the famous cabaret. She's standing behind a bar. Much of what we see behind her is a reflection. It's meant to be a reflection. There's a mirror. You can see the gilded edge along the bottom, just above the bar itself. There's also a customer reflected in the back of the mirror. And it may be that that customer is supposed to be us in some ways. That maybe the viewer is that mustachioed gentleman talking to the server. The painting is full of detail, but it's not very clear exactly what's going on here. We may find that not so unusual, but viewers in the 1880s would have found it deeply puzzling. They expected paintings, and especially paintings of this size, of this detail, to tell a story, and probably to tell a rather familiar story, one that they would know from the Bible or from classical mythology. Here, we're in a realm of radical uncertainty. The painting is quite reserved. It doesn't tell us what to think. And that reflects the reserve of the central figure herself. We really don't know what she's thinking. Is she looking at us, the viewer? Is she looking at the customer? Maybe the two are the same, but we don't know. Maybe she's looking at the spectacle, at the cabaret itself. You'll see in the corner of the painting some acrobat's legs. So there is a spectacle going on here, but Manet mostly withholds it from us. And so we're plunged into many uncertainties. We don't know how to read this painting. We see the server herself. She's dressed up by the management. She's supposed to add allure to the products that are on sale. And some of those products you can see on the bar in front of her. There are, for instance, bottles of Bass beer imported from England. So already a global, or at least an international, commodified brand. You can see the triangles on the bottles. There are roses, there are fruit. As in the modern department stores of the day, in which it was an innovation that you could feel the products, touch them before you bought. And she herself, her status is rather uncertain. Is there some sense in which she may be for sale as well? It seems to set up a kind of narrative, but it's a narrative that's impossible to read. And that would have been very disturbing for many people in the 1880s. The light in this painting is most unusual. This is one of the earliest depictions of electric light anywhere. Uh, the technology was only a few years old when Manet painted this. And it is this bright, evanescent, blinding light of commodity spectacle. It's oddly the light that we still see in supermarkets. It's a light which Manet suggests as much obscures as describes. 
It's a light that delineates, but also dazzles. When we look at the details of the painting, we look closely at the surface of the painting, we start to realize that many of the details that we thought were there, as we step in and look closer and closer, they seem to dissolve into incohate forms. Certainly, if we look at the people on the balcony reflected in the mirror, they're only really suggested. When we really look at them, we can see that they're very, very brushy and kind of dissolved forms. There is a fluid bohemian scene reflected in the mirror uh, in which women were playing quite a part. Some of them, indeed, were artists or writers. Uh, Mary Cassatt, an avant-garde impressionist painter of the time, uh, actually looking at the scene with a pair of opera glasses. The painting surface itself and the social scene that it describes and the form of this new light all come together in a formal social and political compact. Many people in Paris at this time would have been very disturbed by the way in which the old hierarchies, obviously of aristocracy, of the bourgeoisie, of the working class and so on, were being dissolved in this strange melting pot. Much of the conventional painting of the time would have insisted on the certainties of hierarchy, uh, both in its subject matter and in the kind of stories that it told. So to show a sales girl, as she would have been known in France at that time, as a central figure of such an elaborate, labor-intensive, large-scale picture would have been very, very unusual. And it would have disturbed viewers. To bring the engines of high art, all of that artifice and prestige to the depiction of modern life, that is avant-garde. It was the role of the avant-garde to look at contemporary life, at the everyday, and to insist on all the uncertainties and the troubles, in a sense, that this threw up. Manet is trying to show you that fully and push you right into it. The very standard criticism of Impressionist painting at the time is that it wasn't finished. It looked like something that somebody would do as an oil sketch, a preparation for something else. The paintings in the Academy were very finely finished, with a very smooth paint surface in which you couldn't really detect the brush strokes. An avant-garde painting like this would not have been accepted into the state academies. These paintings are meant for a completely different audience. They're not meant for those state patrons. They're not meant to hang in great museums and, and, and galleries or town halls. You know, they're, they're not there for those state ideological propaganda purposes. They're meant to appeal to a middle-class audience which is new, which is experiencing a new urban scene and experiencing it in ways which are ambivalent uh, and difficult. So the break, the avant-garde break, was to do with an evolving dealership system in which paintings were bought and sold privately and particularly to middle-class clients. Manet was very aware of this. He'd helped to evolve that system himself and he was aware of what it meant for the artists themselves, how he would have to be uh, an individual like those middle-class patrons. It's there in his branding, which is very, very self-conscious, in the way that he places his signature over the branding of one of the labels of the bottles. The way that Marx talked about commodity culture was to say that everything solid melts into air. Uh, Capitalism dissolved the old social relations, the old certainties, the old religions, or so he thought. So that everything is thrown into flux, and no one knows where that's heading, least of all the capitalists themselves. Manet is just showing you a fragment of that society, but he's saying within that fragment, you don't know what's going on. So that's why it's troubling, that's why it's radical. To the extent that this painting get sold in postcards and through other products in the shop. Its troublesomeness, its contradictoriness, its ambiguity tends to get lost. If we only see a pleasing impressionist beauty here in this very now very familiar image, then in fact we lose the central meaning of the painting, which is asking us to think about a society in which everything is for sale.